States of America. Citizens United case, one year ago, we said the corporations have the same rights of people to spend their money however they want on elections. With almost no restrictions, and that's the way it should be because corporations are people. Don't you see what's happening in the United States? We voted to give the corporations even more control over our elections than they already had. And we sold out the American people one more time. I'm Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and I voted against this awful idea. I'm Justice Clarence Thomas, and I'm an Oreo. I believe my colleagues just bought the best democracy money can buy. Our guest is Janice Thompson. Janice is the director of Oregon Common Cause. Uh, Common Cause was founded in 1970 while Lyndon Johnson was president as a, as a citizen's lobby to make the U.S. political system more open and accountable. So welcome to the show. Thanks. Actually, to be back. Uh, welcome to, I, yeah, I'd like to welcome you back. There so, you go. Good. Thank you. Uh, the last time you were here, you were talking about the National Popular Vote, which mm -hmm. is an effort to invalidate or make ineffective the Electoral College. I wondered if you could give us a quick update on that effort. It has been, a, it's an interstate compact process. Uh, one other state, California, has uh, signed on, which has increased. Since we talked. Yeah, since we talked, which has um, uh, increased the uh, kind of the, the visibility of the, of the effort, resulting in, I think, growing opposition, which sometimes you get defined by, you know, who's opposing you and the level of opposition. So, um, that is kind of occurring. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in Oregon, we may see some discussion of it in the February legislative session. Probably the focus in Oregon will um, be the next 2013 session, but right. stay tuned on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, good, thank you. Uh, so uh, what we do want to talk about today is the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court decision, Citizens United. Mm -hmm. And so, can you give us a, uh, a, a description of what that decision was and right. how it has affected common right. cause? Right. The decision was made, um, came out in January of 2010. So we're coming up to the second year anniversary. And in those two years, um, you know, concern about it keeps growing. So to recap, though, what it did, it focused on one aspect of the flow of money in federal uh, elections, which are independent expenditures, and they are treated differently from direct contributions to candidate candidates. Independent expenditures are when an individual or a PAC um, pays for advertising or some type of electioneering in support of or against a candidate. but it's independent of that candidate. So they and don't, they don't the, the, the two groups, the candidate and the folks doing the independent can, the campaign, yeah. don't sit down at a table and plan and it pl out. Exactly, it. right. Um, you know, sometimes there's questions raised about how independent, but that's the, 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 the idea. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact that independent expenditures are treated differently than direct contributions dates back to Buckley v. Vallejo. Um, in that decision, the Supreme Court um, did uphold the idea of limits on direct contributions to candidates because of the potential for corruption or percent potential for corruption. Mm -hmm. But 
the bill uh, or the legislation um, litigated in Buckley also included limits on what are called on these independent expenditures from individuals, associations, and PACs. And the court said, no, that's not okay because there's no potential for corruption because they're independent. The other kind of government interest suggested uh, concerning putting limits on independent expenditures was an interest in um, kind of fairness, kind of uh, wanting to equalize the relative ability of individuals and groups to affect the outcomes. And so the court back in Buckley said yes to limits on direct contributions, but no to um, limits on independent expenditures from these certain groups. But one subject, one category of independent expenditures that wasn't even discussed in Buckley, um, because there's just been a history of limits on uh, corporate campaign spending, kind of dating back to 1907 in the Tillman Act, um, Buckley did not address independent expenditures from uh, corporate uh, treasury dollars. Mm -hmm. And union treasury. And union also. treasury. Corporate, in that case, means both businesses and, you know, um, trade associations and, and, as you say, unions. So this question did not come up about, you know, um, and so even after Buckley, the limits on independent expenditures from these corporate treasury dollars held. And that then is the the focus of um, of Citizens United, um, but we shouldn't think that Citizens United. Um, and so what Citizens United did was overturn this ban on using corporate treasury dollars for independent expenditures. In the case of businesses, that means corporate profits. In the case of unions, that means treasury dues. So that's what Citizens United did. It it. Um, but you have to keep in mind that independent expenditures from individuals and PACs and associations, you know, have been okay for quite some time. So, for example, back in 2008, in the Senate race between now Senator Merkley and then um, Senator, former Senator Gordon Smith, if you remember watching TV that fall, there were like lots and lots and lots of TV ads. Mm -hmm. Well, about half of those TV ads were paid for by those campaigns. But roughly the other half were from the independent expenditures. Mm -hmm. So in other words, independent expenditures are not new because of Citizens United. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. okay. But one category of independent expenditures those paid for with the corporate treasury dollars, that's the door that's now open. Mm -hmm. Now the reason that door had previously been closed was because of, um, kind of like I say, a history of limits on more related to corporate uh, spending. Um, and in 1947, that was expanded to unions, the Taft-Hartley Act um, barred la both labor unions and corporations from making um, ex uh, expenditures and contributions in federal elections. Um, and that then kind of carried, you know, like I say, carried through in Austin such that this ban on the corporate treasuries for independent expenditures didn't even come up mm -hmm. in Buckley. Uh, but there was a really critical case in 1990 out of the state of Michigan called Austin that really kind of clearly delineated why it is that this particular um, ban on corporate spending was okay. And the the compelling state interest for making that regulation was due to, and this is a quote that you might have heard, the corrosive and distorting effects of immense aggregations of wealth that are accumulated with the help of the corporate form mm -hmm. and that have little or no correlation to the people's, to the public support for the corporation's political ideas. So if you read Citizens United, it's all about this Austin case mm -hmm. with the majority saying Austin was wrongly decided and is an outlier and 
they were well within their rights to kind of open what could have been pretty narrowly decided into a much broader case with the dissenters saying, wait, Austin was just fine, what are you talking about? But the, uh, the Austin rationale had been used as um, the basis for some restrictions on uh, electioneering in McCain-Feingold mm -hmm. that had been upheld in a big, you know, there, there was a big court case upholding that called McConnell. Mm -hmm. And so Citizens United overturned Austin and this part of McConnell kind of related that, and it was that part of, of the, the BICRA that this nonprofit group, Citizens United, was running into problems with, with their uh, movie, Hillary, that, you know, even the majority dis uh, decision in Citizens United, I mean, they acknowledge that that was, like, clearly a campaign piece. Mm -hmm. um, the question that, you know, that, that the, you know, the problem that for the Citizens United nonprofit was like what all they could pay for it because of the um, restrictions in, in BICRA that linked back to this Austin case. And so that's what we've done. Now what, what Citizens United didn't do is it didn't overturn uh, a long time, that long time ban on using corporate treasury dollars for direct contributions. To, to the candidates To the candidates, themselves, right. right. Mm -hmm. But this previously uh, closed door for independent expenditures using treasury dollars is the door that's now open. And like Austin says, it, it may be kind of a small change, but it has a lot of impact because there's just a lot of money that can start coming through that door. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's, that's really what it did. Mm -hmm. And isn't the other part of the problem is that uh, because corporations hadn't been able to contribute either to candidate or to independent campaigns prior, that there were no laws requiring disclosure well, uh, and identification of who was giving the money? The disclosure comes in a little later. Um, actually, one of the the other rationales back in the Austin for saying that this ban on use of corporate treasuries for independent expenditures is okay is that unions and corporations could form affiliated PACs that you know they could they could go out to their the public or their their members and say you know we think X Y Z and help support our PAC all those PAC contributions were fully disclosed. So the fact that, so another element of Citizens United was saying, no, 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 that's not good enough. You know, it's, there's too many hassles involved in setting up these affiliated PACs. Um, so there already had, you know, prior to Citizens United, the PAC was the vehicle for these contributions. Reporting was, was required. So, after Citizens United, what we started to see in the 2002 election cycle, um, there's an example from Oregon. In the Eugene area, uh, Representative Peter DeFazio started to be attacked um, in TV ads paid for by a group, Concerned Taxpayers for America. Well, concern, this was a what's kind of started to be called a super PAC. And the formation of super PACs uh, occurred because of a combination of the Citizens United and a lower case decision called Speech Now. Because that's the other point. So, you know, Citizens United has spun off subsequent litigation. It's like, well, on the basis of Citizens United, you know, this and this and this. So Speech Now was one of these cases and set off the creation of these super PACs. So super PACs can raise unlimited amounts of money from any source, corporate treasuries, trade associations, individuals, unions, and then turn around and spend unlimited amounts to advocate for and against um, political candidates. Prior to Citizens United, like I mentioned, you know, PACs could make um, independent expenditures, but there were some limits into how much money could go into those PACs. So that's what, you know, that's gone. 
Um, but but it is still a PAC, which means eventually its donors are reported to the Federal Election Commission. And, you know, in the presidential... You run the super PACs. Right. Because they're a PAC. Uh, are, are eventually, so... Right. Okay. Well, and, and they're, they're, just re they're, they're reported on the timelines that are just mapped out for the federal elec you know, by the Federal Election Commission. Um, and I, as I understand it, there's two different timelines. Uh, none of them are like super frequent, um, but not surprisingly, most of the, the super PACs take this take one of the two options that has them reporting. I think it's about every six months. Oh, okay. So eventually, then it was known who was making these contributions. But not um, necessarily before the election. Well, in the case of Congressman DeFazio, it was reported before oh. that. Um, November 2010 election. Um, and it turned out that there were just two major donors behind this group concerned taxpayers of, uh, of America. Um, and they, um, you know, you might kind of say that a better name for that PAC might have been two concerned rich taxpayers targeting just two candidates since their spending was only on these anti DeFazio ads and on ads, you know, targeting a first-term congressman in Maryland. Um, so very focused. Yeah, Defo DeFazio, as we know, won, but that, you know, Maryland congressman lost. So, you know, like I mentioned, as a spin-off of Citizens United, the, the lo a lower court had said in spe the Speech Now case that um, the argument that you know, those kinds of really large donations to groups that make independent expenditures could result in corruption or the potential of corruption just, you know, doesn't hold water. And, and one quote from that decision was, was, whatever the merits of those arguments before Citizens United, they plainly have no merit after Citizens United. Contributions to groups that make only independent expenditures cannot corrupt or create the appearance of corruption. This whole focus, narrow focus on corruption and the perception of corruption is, however, one of those, it's just one of those things that makes sense to the courts and to lawyers, but kind of flies in the face of common sense if you kind of talk to most people on the street. And I strongly suspect that that Maryland congressman who lost that race wouldn't, you know, wouldn't also agree. Mm -hmm. um, so. The uh, the before Citizens United, those two major donors, you know, could have made, you know, could have spent money. They would have had to have just done it directly, uh, not through a super PAC. Um, and so, even though the super PAC did eventually require disclosure, it was delayed somewhat. And the super PACs are hot and heavy on all sides in the presidential uh, primary and there are some like for example in Iowa the timing of the super PAC disclosure did not occur for the Iowa caucuses mm -hmm. so you know it's just the reason reporting timelines just what we're gonna know can in link to which prime just depends on the uh, match up or not of the reporting deadlines and the, the timing of the elections. Mm -hmm. But at least with a super PAC, um, there is some level of reporting. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, you, but the other thing about Citizens United that was seen in the 2010 is that 67% of total expend, independent expenditures came from these new groups that were kind of freed up by Citizens United. Mm -hmm. And that the trend is just really, really going to continue. Um, the other factor is that the activity of political 501c groups increased from 0% of total spending by outside groups in 2006 to 42% in 2010. And that trend 
presumably is only going to continue. Now, this does not include the 501c3 groups. You know, the, they can't get involved in candidate campaigns, but includes C4 groups that are often run by organizations focused on a particular issue, like the Sierra Club, you know, has okay. a C4. Mm -hmm. Trade associations, like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, or, you know, a C6 group. Um, and, and unions are, a, you know, a particular you know, 501c number. These groups are regulated by IRS rules, and all those numbers relate to the IRS code. Right. Um, uh -huh. And I, the IRS rules, though, don't require disclosure of donors. And so Post Citizens United are also hearing a lot more about secret money in politics and it's money that's being you know, funneled through these different 501c groups. Oh, okay, so money that would be f that would be donated to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce would only be identified as coming from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Exactly. When in fact, right. you know, we really want to know who's funding the Chamber right. of Commerce. Right. right. Um, now, it's important to recognize that the IRS not requiring disclosure didn't just come out of the blue. The origin of that anonymous. Um, uh, contributions comes from the civil rights era uh, because there were several groups in the South um, that were active working on civil rights. Um, several southern states, Alabama in particular, you know, sued saying you, know, you need to disclose who your donors are. It was very clearly a tactic to expose donors oh. to a group oh. that you know, would have had potentially life-threatening implications. I mean, mm -hmm. it was a really mm -hmm. serious matter. Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't just think, oh, you know, the IRS, what are they thinking? You know, there, there, there is this... So there's a historic base for basis these. Basis for these, right. okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. the, other, the other key element is that there's lots of 501C groups um, active that, you know, follow all the rules and whatnot, and uh, the other, but the other concern that's coming up are um, are are some of these 501 C4s in particular, really pushing the envelope, and they're um, not they don't really have any other function except being a source of money, and, and then in which case they're abusing. You know, they, they they really should be a pack. Mm -hmm. So. The, the bottom line is that, you know, like I say, when you hear about secret money, um, it's not the super PACs, it's the, because eventually the, those donors are disclosed. Mm -hmm. But if somebody really wants to, you know, use corporate treasury money, that's the door that's now open. Mm -hmm. It can go to those organizations and, um, and be secret. So. Okay. Those so, are some of the trends in the 2010 election cycle that, I mean, already we see, particularly related to the super PACs, um, are going to be prominent features of the 2012 election cycle. Okay. All right. So in about two minutes, tell us what common cause is doing about all this. Well, there's, there's three items, and the important thing to keep in mind is that they're not mutually exclusive. Okay. One is disclosure. Um, there is a has been a legislation in Congress to um, try to tease out, you know, the appropriate way to force disclosure by the 501c groups and to address um, and tighten up the rules so those IRS designations are not being abused. Mm -hmm. um, public financing as a reform strategy is not at all affected by Citizens United, and um, I think the Citizens United has really just, you know, added fuel to the fire about from people saying, look, it's really hard to amend the Constitution, but that's what we need to start talking about. Mm -hmm. And so those have been the three um, elements. One other little subcategory of the disclosure piece is there's also been a lot of effort related on kind of corporate accountability that if corporations are going to start making these contributions to um, 
make sure that it's disclosed and you know their shareholder input. Right, yeah, and because currently the shareholders don't necessarily, in fact, they don't have any ability. Well, to it varies. There are actually, there are definitely some corporations that, you know, have, a, you know, a democratic process, but they're um, not, that's not the norm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's yeah. been a lot of push on mm -hmm. that, on that. Front. To have shareholders say. Right, right. right. Yeah. And have those have that push for shareholders say has that been uh, require has the push been toward requiring corporations to follow what the shareholders say or has it just been advisory? And I'm sorry, we got about thirty seconds. Um, I think it's a combination. Um, I, I think the you know the proposals are trying to you know have it be as, as strong as possible. Um, a lot of times it defaults to all we're going to do is just disclose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for joining Thanks us again. Thanks for the chance to come back. Okay, good. So we've been talking with Janice Thompson. Janice Thompson, Executive Director of Oregon Common Cause. And there, her contact information is there if you would like to get a hold of her. Uh, we also do want to make note now of a future event here in Portland. Actually, it's a nationwide event. Uh, and we call that Occupy the Courts um, in Janu as we've just been talking. In January of 2010, the U.S. Supreme Court issued their Citizens United uh, case giving additional human constitutional rights belonging to we, the people, to corporations. So now we occupy the courts. Join the Alliance for Democracy, move to mend, and other pro-democracy, anti-corporate power organizations around the nation as we occupy the courts for one day of action, drawing the connection between ever-increasing domination by corporations and the destruction of our democracy. In over 80 cities, people will gather to lead the charge on the judiciary that created and continues to expand corporate personhood rights. From the United States Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C. to Pioneer's Courthouse Square here in Portland, we will gather in Portland, gather at Pioneer Courthouse Square on January 20th at 1130. We'll rally and march starting at 12 noon. The newly formed Portland Raging Grannies, the Alliance for Democracy's U.S. Corporate Supreme Court Justices, who we saw in the intro uh, piece for this interview, and speakers will be there to entertain and inform. And then we'll march and surround the Pioneer Courthouse itself. So that's uh, Friday, January 20th, beginning at 11.30. If your local public access station, access station does not broadcast populist dialogues, please ask them to do so. They do so at no cost at www.pegmedia.org. Mission Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. Learn more at thealliancefordemocracy.org. I want to thank our crew today. We wouldn't be on the air without them, so thank you to Janet Morris, Beth Kerwin, Tom Thomas, Joan Horton, Roger Bates, and Hollis Benedict. And thanks to you, the audience, for watching. We hope that you'll join us again next week. Bye.